Welcome, friends, to the B.R. Shanoi Memorial Lecture 2020, given by Dr. Vivek Devaroy, Chairman, Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. This memorial lecture is titled The Roots of Reform, Professor B.R. Shanoi and the Economic Ideas that Changed India. My name is Kumar Anand, and I will be your host this evening. The lecture will be followed by a question answer session. We will have about 15 to 20 minutes towards the end, and I hope to present to our speaker as many of your questions as possible. Uh, please enter your questions and queries in the chat window to the bottom of your screen. The Memorial Lecture is organized together by the Center for Civil Society, New Delhi, and the Economic Research Center Trust, Mangalore. It is a great pleasure for me to thank our speaker for accepting our invitation on behalf of CCS President, Dr. Parjay Shah, ERC Trust Chairman, Sri Giridhar Prabhu, and my fellow board members of the ERC Trust, Sri M. N. Pai and Professor Subodh Arshinoy. The economic policy ideas of uh, Professor B. R. Shinoy will be discussed by our speaker, but those who know about the life and work of Professor Shinoy would know him a deeply patriotic, a jail freedom fighter who saw Indian independence as part of a larger social uplift, such as in the equal education of women. Professor Shinoy believed that national progress could only come from a market economy, liberal democracy, social mobility, and equality of all under the law. For him, economic growth only had meaning if it involved the betterment of R.K. Lakshman's common man. He often referred to the Gandhian talisman of for policy making, that of seeing the face of the poorest when making policy decisions. Our speaker this evening is, of course, well known in India and abroad. Dr. Bibik Debroy is presently the Prime Minister's economic advisor. He has done early work, research work in economics at Cambridge University, and he has taught at Presidency College, my alma mater, Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics, the Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, and at the National Council of Applied Economic Research. Among other things, Dr. Debroy has been a member of Niti Aayog, has chaired a committee to restructure Indian railways, and has served as director of a legal reforms commission shared by the Finance Ministry and the UNDP. Uh, remarkably, Dr. Debroy has also been able to move gracefully between the ephemeral and present world of editing financial newspapers and the lasting and the ancient world of translating the Mahabharata. He is also the recipient of 2015 Padma Shri Award. We are all very delighted and honored to have him with us today. I would now like to invite Dr. Vivek Debroy to give the Bia Shanoi Memorial Lecture 2020. Dr. Debroy, please. Thank you, Kumar for that very kind introduction. Let me thank the Economic Research Trust and the Center for Civil Society for having invited me to deliver this particular B.R. Shinoy Memorial Lecture. My association with Path Shah and therefore with Center for Civil Society goes back more than 20 years. And let me say that Center for Civil Society and Path have done a lot to propagate the cause of market oriented reforms. And have also popularized what Dr. Shinoy did and what Dr. Shinoy wrote. This particular talk, the Dr. Shinoy Memorial Lecture, also has a subtitle Economic Ideas That Changed India. Yes, of course, the economic Indias that changed India, but changed when and changed in what direction? A lot of people know about Dr. B. R. Chinoy now. Unfortunately, they don't know enough about Dr. B. R. Chinoy. And the superficial impression that floats around about Dr. B. R. Shinoy is something like this. Here was the second five-year plan document. 
Here was a second five-year plan document, which was based on a Feldman Mahalanabish model with an emphasis on the public sector, with an emphasis on capital intensive industrialization, with an emphasis on state defined as government or understood as government, with the state occupying the commanding heights. And Dr. Shenon wrote a minute of dissent, I wrote a minute of dissent to this particular model of the second five-year plan, and in retrospect, he has been proved right. He has been proved right because the consequences of state intervention led to India losing out on several development decades. So in a thumbnail, this is the superficial impression. At a certain level, that superficial impression is indeed correct. But what happened was much deeper. What happened was much deeper. What happened involved action on Dr. Sinoy's part which was much, much more courageous than we can even pretend to understand today. So in the first little bit of my talk, I shall explain what exactly happened in India before 1947, what happened in India post 1950, 1950, because that was when the constitution was enacted. And what was the climate like? What was the intellectual climate like? What was the discourse like? What was the economic philosophy like in the early 1950s? That will be the backdrop to understand why what Dr. Shenoy said was so courageous. At a certain level, whenever I use the word state, I'm not using the word state as in the sense of the 29 states, not in the sense of provinces, but state as economists say, as economists use the word to stand for government. At the heart of it all is a question about what should the state do? What should the state do? In what form should the state do it? Should the state actually produce something? Or is the state's role one of regulation? What is the extent of state intervention? And at one level, as long as the word ideological is not misunderstood, this is an ideological position about what the state should do. And to me, the beginnings of that debate originate in 1931. To me, the beginnings of the debate originate in 1931. What happened in 1931? In 1931, there was the Karachi Resolution of the Indian National Congress. In 1931, there was the Karachi Resolution of the Indian National Congress, and that Karachi Resolution talked about free and compulsory primary education, which is fine, I guess. 
It not only talked about free and compulsory primary education, it also talked about protection against foreign competition. So protection against foreign competition was already getting built in. And this was firmed up in 1937. This was firmed up in 1937 because a Congress Working Committee meeting in Wadha in 1937 recommended that a National Planning Committee should be set up. And that National Planning Committee was indeed set up in the year 1938 it had several meetings. It never led to any reforms. But cast your minds back. At that time, immediately before 1947, there were several people who formulated plans. In other words, it was more or less accepted that India would have to be a planned economy. There were several people who formulated plans. The only one which did not really talk about state intervention that much was a book written by Visheshwaraya in 1934. But it wasn't quite a plan. It was more like perspective planning. Where should India be several years down the line? That book by Visheshwaraya written called uh, Planned Economy for India. But if you look at all the other plans, whether it was the Bombay plan of 1944 and 1945, whether it was the people plan of 1944, whether it was even the Gandhian plan of 1944, cutting across all of these plans, Certain propositions were taken as axiomatic. A. Industrial lives would have to be driven by public investments. B. There would have to be extensive state intervention in the economy. And C. External trade was peripheral. So these three tenets that I mentioned were accepted as axiomatic across whoever was in that interested in development in India. After all this, we had the Industrial Policy Resolution of 1948. And if I read the Industrial Policy Resolution of 1948, what stands out? And remember, this was the Industrial Policy Resolution of 1948, not that of 1956. In the Industrial Policy Resolution of 1948, certain principles were clearly articulated. A. There would be a National Planning Commission. B. There would be state monopoly in some sectors. C. There would be possible nationalization of private enterprises. D. In cases where there was foreign capital involved, there would be majority Indian equity. No one contested these principles. They were accepted as given. And consequently, in 1951, one of my pet peeves has been that economists talk about economic policies, quite often they neglect the laws that were enacted to implement those policies. But I'm not here to talk about my pet peeves. In 1951, we had the Industries Development and Regulation Act of 1951. 
and that industries development and regulation act of 1951 set out a first schedule of items where the state could control and regulate and over a period of time more and more items kept getting added to that first schedule so the heavy handed state intervention that we were going to witness later came about largely courtesy the industries development and regulation act of 1951 what else happened i said earlier that the constitution was enacted in 1950 when the constitution was enacted in 1950 in the course of the constituent assembly debates dr ambedkar regarded as one of the architects of the indian constitution and mind you the constitution provides the framework for all laws that are passed in india in the course of the constituent assembly debates on 15th of november 1948 dr ambedkar said the word socialist should not be there in the constitution why should the word socialist not be there in the constitution we know it's there in the preamble now but why should it not be there in the constitution because dr ambedkar said that socialism means a certain kind of economic ideology and since this constitution is going to last why should we presume today what the citizens of the future will want the nature of the constitution and the nature of the polity to be like in terms of state intervention that socialism is equated with all right the constitution was passed it had several elements that could be interpreted as socialism but at least in that day and age the word socialism was not explicitly used in the constitution that happened later meanwhile through a cabinet resolution on 15th of march 1950 the planning commission was established and as i said earlier almost everyone agreed there should be a planning commission and we had a first five year plan today or even earlier when economists talk about the first five year plan they say ah the first five year plan the harrod domer model what does the harrod domer model say the harrod domer model says here is the savings rate for the economy which for all practical purposes closed economy can be taken at the investment rate here is the savings rate for the economy divided by the capital output ratio and whatever is the result will be the rate of growth so if you want to increase the growth rate typically you will have to increase the savings rate oblique investment rate alternatively you will have to reduce the capital output ratio so what is the prevailing wisdom as depicted in economic indian economic history textbooks as depicted in indian economic history textbooks the prevailing wisdom is here is the first five year plan based on the harrod domer model and in this 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 if you go back and look at the history you will find that the first five year plan did no such thing at that time the colombo plan was being set up as a result of the colombo plan being set up as part of the commonwealth consultative committee india had to formulate a six year program and essentially the first five year plan was a repetition of what india did for that six year program for the commonwealth consultative committee was there mention of any model no there was no mention of any model economists may love models but the era of models into planning 
came only towards the end of the 60s, not before that. So the planning commission and the first five year plan had no particular model. It was only later on when Brahmanand wrote a paper in 1955, when K.N. Raj wrote a paper in 1961, trying to explain what the first five year plan of 51 to 56 was doing, that they thought of a model. Let me now seemingly go off on a tangent. And there are several things to note. The first thing to note is in 1955, Milton Friedman visited India. In 1955, Milton Friedman visited India. He was an advisor to the then finance minister, C.D. Deshmukh. 55, mind you. All of this, all of these trends that I am now about to describe are trends that happened when the first five-year plan was already underway and preparations were being made for the second five-year plan. In the midst of this, in 55, and the second five-year plan would be for the period 56 to 61, in 1955, Milton Friedman visited India. And he wrote a devastating critique which surfaced much later. And this devastating critique pointed out the distortions in resource allocation that were being caused and the distortions in the capital labor ratio that were being caused by the policies that the government of India was following. So this was the first thing to note, that in 1955, Milton Friedman wrote this devastating critique. Meanwhile, before Mahalanobis joined the planning commission, mind you, before Mahalanobis joined the planning commission, he joined the planning commission in 1955, January 1955. Before he joined the planning commission, in Sankhya, he enunciated a two-sector model in the year 1953. Often referred to as the feldman Malinovich model, and Feldman stated a similar kind, formulated a similar kind of model in Russian in 1928. I don't think it has yet been proved whether Mahalanobish knew of the existence of the Feldman model at that time or not, because the Feldman model was, became available in English much later, but that's neither here nor there. So Mahalanobish produced this two-sector model in 53, followed up by a four-sector model in 55, both published in Sankhya. Nice, sophisticated model. And to repeat, economics textbooks will routinely say this was the model adopted in the second five-year plan, perhaps. But the second five-year plan model had no mention of a plan of a model at all. There was no mention of a plan of a model in any of the documents associated with the second five-year plan. The third strand is Jawaharlal Nehru's remarks at the third meeting of the National Development Council, the NDC, in November 54. So here is the NDC meeting in 1954. The then Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru is making his remark and he says India should have a socialist pattern of society. The second five year plan to which Dr. Shinoy would react is often projected as discontinuity because of the model. I don't think it was discontinuity because of the model. 
the first five year plan did not mention the expression socialism or socialist pattern of society anywhere the second five year plan document mentioned socialism the first five year plan document only talked about the directive principles of state policy it did not mention socialism or the socialist pattern of society the second five year plan started with the socialist pattern of society that was the discontinuity a question can rightly be asked about the relevance of the planning commission the historical planning commission only became relevant when it was in sync with what the political masters wanted and the second five year plan was completely in sync with what the political leadership wanted namely the socialist pattern of society mind you no one objected no one objected i mentioned the ndc meeting the minutes of the ndc meeting has been published did anyone object to the socialist plan of society the answer is no in 1955 john kenneth galbraith turned up in india he turned up as in india as an advisor to isi the indian statistical institute he, he would return as an ambassador to india in 1961 and when he was being examined as a possible ambassador to india he coined the expression post office socialism for what was happening in india but at that time after his isi visit in july 1958 he wrote an article in foreign affairs without using the expression post of his socialism as i explained that expression post of his socialism came later he wrote an article in foreign affairs and essay in foreign affairs criticizing what india was doing i am not aware of any other instance anywhere in the world where milton friedman and john kenneth galbraith of differing ideological persuasions agreed that in what india was doing was wrong milton friedman and john kenneth galbraith both agreed what was happening was wrong there is a book i recommend that everyone should read technically it's banned in india it's a very patronizing book written by a foreign journalist it's very very patronizing it a very patronizing book known as heart of india written by a foreign journalist named alexander kambel in 1958 it's still banned in india which means imports are banned but in this day and age imports and printing is banned but in this day and age you will find that heart of darkness floating around on the net it's a very condescending book it's a very patronizing book but it's a hilarious book about what was being planned in the then planning commission particularly the sections which report a conversation that alexander kambel had with a senior official of the planning commission known as vaidya sharma they are hilarious by the way at that time the statistical system was not what it is today it was just beginning to be set up it was imperfect 
However, we come back to that title, Economic Ideas That Changed India. What was the economic idea that changed India? That economic idea that changed India then was socialism and heavy-handed state intervention. That was the economic idea that changed India. An economic idea that continued in terms of legal changes and policy changes throughout the 1960s and certainly the first half of the 1970s, leading to India losing valuable development decades when other countries were following policies that were different. And mind you, to reiterate what I said, there was consensus then that this was desirable. There was consensus that this needed to be done. First five-year plan, ostensibly, without there being any model, very, very successful. There's a growth rate of about 3.6%, real growth of about 3.6%, not that bad. On an average, the savings rate was 6%. And remember these figures, on an average, the savings rate was 6%. The planning commission felt, aha, if the savings rate is 6%, towards the beginning of the 60s, we should be able to push up that savings rate to 11%. And by the end of the 70s, we should be able to push up that savings rate to 20%. The capital output ratio in the course of the first five-year plan was 1.8, let's say 2. Which means that if I can push up the savings rate to 11%, I'll have a 5.5% real rate of growth. I will do it. If I can push it up to 20%, I will have a 10% real rate of growth. Mind you, For the external world, at that time, India was regarded as a model economy. Here was an economy that was setting about the task of modernization, industrialization, early 60s, late 50s, with the exception of people like Milton Friedman, John Kenneth Galbraith, outsiders, Internally, there is absolute consensus. It is against the background of this that there was a memorandum prepared by a panel of economists in April 1955 to which Dr. Chenoy submitted the minute of dissent. The minute of dissent that everyone knows about. By the way, he expanded on that minute of dissent in a book that he wrote in 1958 called Problems of Indian Economic Development. And essentially in this minute of dissent, remember when was the minute of dissent? The minute of dissent was in 1955. In that minute of dissent, Dr. Shinoy made three points, out of which, in hindsight, the third one was the most important. A, the size of the plan was too optimistic. B, it was impossible for the saving rate to become so high. It was impossible for the savings rate to cross anything more than 8%, not possible. In that sense, the size of the plan was too large. To be, you should not be resorting to deficit financing. And C, given the context, C is the most important, but given the context, C was not spelled out that much. 
He called it policy and institutional measures, which meant opposition to nationalization, which meant opposition to the continuation of controls, and which also meant particularly important in the given context, the price support given to agriculture. So today when we talk about the influence left by the Tashinoi, and we talk about an economic idea that should have changed India then, it is less about the size of the plan, it is less about deficit financing, and it is more about the policy and institutional measures. In hindsight, many of the things Dr. Shinoy said came true. The worst excesses of deficit financing were witnessed in the second half of the 70s. Although it is statistically difficult to control and there were wars and droughts that India would face, by the time of the third five-year plan, the plan had collapsed. So much so that from 66 to 69, we had planned holidays. <coughs> of course, there were people like Bhagwati and Desai, who wrote a very influential book. Influential meaning it was read, it did not impact policy much in 1970 called planning for industrialization government policies change when there are internal arguments internal committees which drive that impetus for change we might tend to think that the reliance on markets, depending on your perspective, began in 1991, depending on your perspective, began earlier. I think the importance of the points that Dr. Shinoy made in terms of policy and institutional measures can be dated to a government committee appointed in 1978, the Dagley Committee on controls and subsidies. Whatever documents surfaced after 1991 were really rehashing the arguments of the Dagley committee using slightly different jargon. Rather tragically, if I'm not wrong, 1978 was the year when Dr. Shinoy died. So in some perverse kind of sense, the year he died, destiny ensured that his ideas, in a way, first came to be accepted. How important was Dr. Shinoy? Dr. Shinoy was important in terms of his ideas, having been original having been against the grain of what was regarded as popular wisdom then. I hope I am not misunderstood when I say that if we try to evaluate Dr. Shinoy in terms of what impact his arguments, his propositions had while he was alive, I don't think he had much of an impact. The essay that Peter Bauer wrote on Dr. Shinoy says that. The essay that Mahesh Bhatt wrote on Dr. Shinoy in that book edited by Parth Shah for Center for Civil Society called Profiles in Courage says Dr. Shinoy was extremely influential in terms of the influence he had on students in terms of the papers he wrote, amongst other places, in Quarterly Journal of Economics. And mind you, unlike academics, academics in the West have somewhat been different, certainly in the US, but unlike academics, Dr. Shinoy, at that time, 
wrote a lot in public uh, newspapers, public articles in newspapers. Indian academics don't typically do that. Whether it is Sarajya, Hindu, Times of India, Statesman, Far Eastern Economic Review. If you look at all of these writings, and this comes across very clearly in the compilation that R.K. Amin and Park Shah edited for Center of Civil Society called Economic Prophecies. If you look at that, particularly at the section where those articles are grouped under policy and institutions, you will find that he progressively amplified his initial apprehension about state intervention even more and more his critique of the state intervention became sharper and sharper as the state intervention intensified over a period of time so his subsequent critique presented a much more coherent critique than the initial minute of dissent that's all perfectly natural i've come to the end of what i wanted to say I think it is now time for someone to write a biography of Dr. Shinoy, not merely a compilation of articles, because what Dr. Shinoy stood for is part of our history, it's part of our legacy, it should be preserved for posterity, not only in terms of his writings, but in terms of who he was, what he stood for, and one of the principles in everything that he did was he stood for dharma the way he interpreted it and saw it. Thank you once again for having invited me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Devroy, for that wonderful, uh, you know, uh, kind of a glimpse into the history of uh, Indian planning and how certain policies were came to be adopted, fortunately and unfortunately. Unfortunately, in the beginning, not the right ones being adopted, and later, uh, probably we are correcting uh, slowly and gradually uh, correcting on those errors. Uh, we have a few questions. The first question comes from... Um, I'm not sure about the name here. Uh, the question is, looking at the ongoing farmer protests, we can see how difficult it is to sell free market ideas to Indians. How can our policies uh, practically incorporate Shinoi's ideas while ensuring that they don't lead to massive protests? I think I will keep my response simple because um, I am delivering a Shinoi Memorial Lecture not stating what the chairman of the Economic Advisory Council feels. So my response would be, please read Dr. Shinoy's arguments, including on intervention for agriculture, and propagate those. That's part of the message that I'm trying to convey. It's not just the minute of dissent. It's all the other stuff that he wrote including on state intervention in agriculture. So what everyone listening in should be doing is reading what Dr. Shinoi had to say and disseminating that argument. Okay, uh, just for our listeners, let me, I mean, for those who do not know, uh, the two books have been edited by uh, Parth Shah and uh, R.K. Amin are titled Economic Prophecies and Theoretical Vision. And the PDF copies of both of them are available on uh, CSIS website. Uh, they are a collection of fantastic essays. And I think the typical, the title of the book was particularly pertinent when says it's called Economic Prophecies. So any chapter you pick, almost anything uh, Professor Shinoy has a, uh, said or advocated or criticized it. I mean, more, or, more often than not, they have come true. Uh, another question comes from uh, one of our listeners here, Akshay Akad. He says, sir, why are we uh, going backward on industrialization? If I understand the question correctly, that's what he said. Yeah. I don't exactly understand what that question means. The question should actually be, 
about Dr. Shinoy and the talk. But let me interpret that question. The share of industry in GDP. People usually use the word industry when they actually mean manufacturing. There are non-manufacturing components to industry also. The share of manufacturing in GDP has been lower than what it should be. It's been flat for a large number of years. For people who are fond of blaming the present government, let me point out that the share of manufacturing in GDP has been flat for at least 40 years now. Sure, it should be higher. Sure, it should be higher, as has been the case in many other countries, East Asia, China. Lest people again, lest people accuse me of trying to be the chairman of the Economic Advisory Council, which I said I wasn't going to do at this particular forum. In the year 2004, the then government set up a National Manufacturing Competitiveness Council. And the NMCC in the year 2005 brought out a report which, if I recall correctly, was called a National Manufacturing Plan, something like that. It will be there on the website. In that, you will have a whole list of reasons as to why manufacturing in India is not doing that well and what should be done to increase the absolute rate of growth as well as perhaps its share in GDP, although the share in GDP, you must remember, also is a function of what's happening to agriculture and is a function of what's happening to services. Uh, the next question comes from Vatsal Mehrotra, and he asks, how can we ensure that the policy corrections being carried out don't give rise to another form of extreme situation? He is meaning uh, crony capitalism. I think uh, people are excessively fond of the expression crony capitalism without recognizing that there is crony socialism also. And since we are talking about a period of the second five-year plan, soon after the second five-year plan, in the 1960s, there were committees the Dutt Committee, the Hazari Committee, and the findings of the Dutt Committee and the Hazari Committee not only established the existence of crony capitalism, but also existed, they exist, also documented the existence of crony socialism. Because essentially, the policies of socialism led to shortages, if there were shortages, things would have to be licensed. If things, were have, if things had to be licensed, then there would be rent-seeking for these. In other words, crony socialism leads to crony capitalism. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, the next question is from the ERC Trust uh, Chairman, uh, Gedar Prabhu. He asks, can you... Uh, Professor Shinoy proposed a gold bank of India as an answer to gold smuggling now. Even now, gold is being smuggled. Um, a lot of things have changed since then. The trouble with uh, gold in India is that, yes, figures are not very reliable. But such figures as exist on stock of gold suggest that most of gold is in the form of gold jewelry. It is not in the form of gold biscuits and coins, which means 
that there is a serious valuation issue. And the gold that I possess in the form of jewelry may not be worth as much as I think it is. So far as the smuggling part of it is concerned, as with several other things, I think that the best antidote to smuggling is to reduce the import duties. The smuggling also happens because of some other reasons, but the main reason in my view, it happens because of misalignments in exchange rates. Sometimes it can be linked to drug trafficking, human trafficking, but substantively it happens because of high import duties. So A, I think import duty should be reduced. And B, there is an issue of monetization of gold. The monetization of gold is not the same as setting up a gold bank, or not in the sense we understand the word gold bank, because there is an issue of testing, valuation, assaying, and effectively, I would use the expression, not gold bank, but multiple gold banks, where I can come and transact in gold, I can go value my gold jewelry, decide this is the amount of gold which is lying unutilized today, it's capital that's, that has no productive value today, I can release it into the system so that tomorrow the jeweler who wants that gold can go to that bank, not the gold bank, but several such banks can go to the bank and purchase the requisite quantity of gold. Now to do this, a whole, whole lot of formalization has to happen. And a prerequisite to that is the essaying, the testing. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from Ashutosh Patel and he asks, how would Dr. Shinoy respond to the recent RBI proposal of allowing large corporate houses to open banks? Um, how would Dr. How Shinoy, would yeah. how would Dr. Shinoy respond? I have absolutely no idea because offhand I can't think of anything that Dr. Shinoy has written then at that time on corporate houses uh, setting up banks. So I don't know. Okay. Uh, okay. The question is, if Dr. Shinoy, uh, next question is from uh, Mr. Rajesh Jain. He says, if Dr. Shinoy were alive today, what, which policies would he be happy with and which would disappoint him? I think these questions are masquerading a little bit. They are ostensibly directed towards Dr. Shinoy, but are actually directed towards me. So, Dr. Shinoy, what he wrote, we know what he wrote. So, mm -hmm. if you read what Dr. Shinoy wrote, you will find your own answers as to what Dr. Shinoy might have decided. Right. Okay. Uh, huh. Next question is from uh, Mr. Paul Thomas. He says, do you think monopolies like Reliance or any firm which receives special support from the government is a threat to free market competition? But then I think the next part is more clearer and is, a, is more generic. Where he says, are we seeing a rise of monopolies in Indian market, at least in some sectors? The world is one of not monopolies, but perfect competition does not exist anywhere in the world. Everywhere, the perfect competition defined as what economists preach as the model of perfect competition, free entry, free exit, infinite number of buyers, infinite number of sellers, no transaction costs, everyone is a price taker. This is just a convenient general equilibrium model for establishing the two theorems of welfare economics. That does not exist anywhere in the world. Therefore, one needs regulation of some form to ensure 
that barriers are not created to entry through unfair business practices through restrictive business practices and perhaps even with a question mark about the structure of the market because the question is not to ask whether x company has y percent share in that segment that's not the question to ask the question to ask is the forces of competition would have whittled down that y percent share that y percent share only exists either because there are unfair trade practices or restrictive business practices or there are restrictive barriers because of intellectual property rights high fixed cost of entry various other things so per se the share i think is a very misleading indicator uh next question uh from one hour uh, I, i don't have the name is what does the future of planning look like in india and what would you be the right way to go i think this pertains to our to your talk today and what uh, mr shinoy uh, wrote all through his life what is the what does the word planning mean the word planning means multiple things to multiple people interpreted as a five year plan which try to allocate resources that idea is dead increasingly in a system where decisions are made on the basis of private choices not public ones but there is a certain notion in which the word planning existed in the form of planning commission in terms of the perspective plan division remember i mentioned dr visheshwaraya's book earlier that kind of perspective planning continues to be necessary because after all to take one particular example there are the sustainable development goals with targets and indicators so there needs to be a plan in this that sense of perspective planning of this is where i want india to be 20 years from now 30 years from now 10 years from now this is not the same as equating it to the old five year plans so i think the answer depends entirely on what we mean by plan and i think dr shinoy i don't think he wrote about this but i think dr shinoy would have been perfectly happy with the to visheshara as not with the other plants yeah okay so this is the last question uh, uh, we'll take uh, because we also have a very hard stop at uh, 6:30 vamsi asks is there any scope for india to move towards a future with less government intervention with india's majority population looking at the government as a major provider and what we as the future of india can do it to move in that direction let me answer this question a little bit differently i have said all kinds of things against socialism in a country like ours with an indirect democracy our voices are reflected in terms of what political parties do after the amendment to the preamble to the constitution in the mid 1970s the representation of the people's act of 51 52 was amended so that every political party in india has to be registered as a socialist party let the import of that sink in every political party in india has to be registered as a socialist political party shouldn't we before asking questions ask ourselves are we comfortable with that if you are not are we raising our voices if you aren't raising our voices we should be prepared to accept that all political parties in india will be socialist and therefore all policies in india will be socialist so the buck actually stops with us as citizens 
because it's not just a cliche that citizens get the governments that they deserve, but in a sense, the governments reflect indirectly in a democracy like ours, the will of the people. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Debroy. So once again, uh, to close it up, uh, on behalf of CSIS President Part Shah and ERC Trust Chairman Sri Gridhar Prabhu and my fellow board members of ERC Trust, uh, MN, Mr. Aman Pai and uh, Professor Shubodh Arshinoy, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bibek Debroy, for sparing time and, and uh, to deliver the 2020 B. R. Shinoy Memorial Lecture. Uh, with this, uh, we will uh, close this up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.